Today's guest on the Salt Water Edge podcast is a passionate man. Whether it's paintball, capturing cool video, or his beloved striped bass, he's all in. Today's guest has been a steady supporter of catch and release to ensure we have a healthy striper population for years to come. He has followed his passion uh, into product development and looking for better solutions for surf casters. Please welcome from Comanche Surf Casting, the smiling tan man, Pete Uchig. How are you, Pete? You're smiling. <laughs> How about that? Always, Peter. Always. I like your shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? I yeah. have my Soul Water's Edge shirt in the back. I wasn't sure if I was going to wear it or not. <laughs> I like that one too. Yeah, the uh, you know it's it's uh, it's great to have you here. We worked hard to, to get this together, you know, um, and you really have a lot going on uh, uh, with um, a movie we'll talk about, with Phase Gear, with uh, the time you spent on striped bass, the time you spent on tarpon. Um, you know what uh, what. How did you become a passionate surf caster? Can you tell us a bit about your fishing journey? Because standing in a rock at night in a wetsuit is a long way from my dad had me with a worm and a panfish, you know? So can you give me some of that? A little segue there? Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> I, guess that's a, I guess that's a good question. I, I ask myself the same thing all the time. Mm -hmm. And I get, uh, look, looking back, it's whatever you, whatever I try and do something, I kind of, go all in whether mm -hmm. it's whether it's paintball fishing like you said uh, my career um i'm always trying to push myself to do the best that i can uh mm -hmm. in, in sports too and I'm, I'm not the most athletic guy and i'm far from the best fisherman but i always want to be the best that i can be and that's the cool thing about fishing is there's always another hurdle to overcome overcome there's yeah. always a way to be better there's always something to learn you're always getting challenged and you got a place you haven't been that you want to try. You've got a fish you haven't caught. You've got a method you're not as good at as you want to be. Yeah, absolutely. Right. It's just, it, that's one of the things that's so great about it. Yeah, it makes it fun. It's, 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 you can do whatever you want. It's, it's like being in your own imagination. Mm -hmm. One day you could say, I want to take out my 11 foot rod and try and catch a 50 pounder. And the next day you could say, I want to take out my seven foot rod and try and catch an Albie. And then, my six foot rod and try and catch a weak fish. And then you don't catch any of the three. You want to pull your hair. You want to pull your hair out. And you're like, I, why don't I just go back to being something that I'm doing something that I'm good at. Yeah. But I think that's what makes it exciting. And throughout the process of surf casting, uh, I think I just found my way into a love for targeting these big striped bass. Cause mm -hmm. I feel that in the Northeast that catching a trophy size striped bass is, is, is difficult no matter what it is and right. relevant to your area when you're fishing where you're fishing a trophy fish could be 20 pounds or a trophy fish could be 60 pounds yeah, it's yeah. you when you challenge yourself in a boat you could just pay a guide and he'll take you out and you 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 know whatever you yo-yo a, a porgy or something and you get right. a 78 pounder and you're like oh that was cool look at my big fish you let it go and i don't feel like that that's a challenge if you yeah. you hook a 38 pounder and a needle fish during a nor'easter on a rock pile and you land that fish when you, I mean, it's a feeling that you get that's it's tough to explain unless you do it. It's a feeling of achievement. Yeah. And I think that that follows you throughout your whole life is when you It's a feeling also of putting it all together, right? Of course, it's because, a real life um, puzzle. Curiosity is what got you on that rock in the first place. I mean, you thought that this kind of stuff could come together. You, I'm sure you thought about tides and you thought about moons. You thought about all the migrations and the bait and all this stuff, which I hope we talk about. But yeah. you do all that in that processor and then uh, you commit the time and the effort. And when it comes together, man, it's, you know, regardless, I, I've told this story before, so I, I, I'll, I'll keep it quick. But basically, I was trying to get better at bucktails. And because uh, some of the best fishermen I knew crush on bucktails, right? And so... Uh, and I have a place that I have Boulder Field that I fish, fished since I grew up, but I never really did it with a bucktail. And um, so I put some time in there, you know, not a ton, but I, I, I remember the feeling of I'm doing this right when the bucktail had some swim and some side pressure, you know, and it felt different than clanging off a rock or the real like, you know, yank snap jigging. I don't know what you call it, but you know what I mean? It really felt like it, I like this thing's sexy and bam, I was tight. It was a confidence thing of it coming together. Yep. working at it, sticking with it. I feel you. It's absolutely, it's the most satisfying part. And it was, a, you know, I don't know, an 18 pound striper. I mean, no one's going to go, wow, Jenks, awesome. But I was walking on. <laughs> no, but you did. You yeah. did. I see. That's what, that's what the cool thing about fishing is that I, that I love is, is we don't eat most of the fish. There's nothing wrong with right. keeping a fish or whatever. Right. And you don't, 
Totally agree. There's no trophy you get. And maybe you fish a tournament and you're really good. There are some guys that are fantastic tournament fishermen, but that's different. When mm. you actually get this sense of accomplishment, it's just for you and maybe your buddy. And that's why the two of you guys are screaming like idiots in the middle of the night. But it's it's I did it. I was right. Or we we were right. And yeah. You say, oh, it's they're here. They're here. Like, why is a grown man in the middle of the night screaming they're here on a rock pile? What like what what is it? But it's a sense of accomplishment of that final piece to the puzzle of, wow, it, everything that I put into this and it worked yeah. for what? Nothing. You get back in your car. No one knows if you caught. Fish. Wait, it's, it's not, not even a game with a scoreboard. No, there's not. There's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like paint and all there's winners and losers, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> and, and for that, you have to have referees and the whole thing and logistics. This yeah. is logistics behind fishing, surf fishing that I find a sense of adventure, gear, yeah. and a buddy. And sometimes you could do it and you could do it yourself, but I, I personally enjoy uh, fishing with other, other pe people that yeah. like it. Cause then you could talk about the plan or, and what's going on, but it, there's no logistics to it. It's get in your car. Like tonight it's what are we in September new moons in a couple of days. So, I mean, all right, there's, they're already, the pieces are starting to fall into the, the puzzle. Right. And that's just, yeah. that's just the start, but you could take any day out of the year, any spot that you live and say, I'm going to go try and catch a fish tonight. And when you do, or you don't, but when you do, you're like, wow, I knew it. And no yeah. one told you about that. And you didn't, you went out and did you it. Yourself. it. You, you, you earned it. And it was, and actually getting to do it is easy. You don't have to be rich. You don't need electronics. You don't need, you just need, just need a sense of adventure and go out and try it. And that's what I think is really cool. That's, that's what kind of got me to this part of my journey is I just want to keep going out. And after I fish, a lot of times I, I feel good about myself overall. Yeah. Yeah. I, I make a plan and I well, follow through. And yeah, it, it, there's something I know it's in, you know, all that you know, I would call it self help literature, but just the idea that per having a purpose correct is uh, is a higher or uh, is good for you. You know what I mean? We don't, uh, as fishermen and outdoorsmen, we don't understand how special we have it because this mm -hmm. love that we all share and this passion. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people in the world, not only are we lucky enough to be able to do this, but there's a lot of people in the world that are in our same position that don't have a passion like this. Right. People look at you when they say, oh, Peter, you're so crazy. You're going out fishing tonight. Why are you tying all these flies? And why are you doing all this stuff? Right. But deep down inside, they wish they were you. At some point, they want to know about your adventure, your journey. They want to know about what you're doing, why you're doing it, especially when they say, oh, Oh, did you keep that fish? Did you eat it? And then you say no, and they start to learn more. They, see it, <laughs> but they see it in you—the excitement yeah. that you're going fishing tonight. Like yeah. I'm going fishing tonight. Like yeah. what? Yeah. Oh, oh, that's so good. But it's a—it is. It's a purpose for you, even if you're just buying a lure or going to the saltwater's edge or calling up your buddy Chris or Frank and talking about mm -hmm. a new lure. The excitement of that, like nobody cares. The, the fish don't. Per I personally don't think the fish care about the color of the lure or think about it. You got hooks dangling off this thing. It's all the, your best lure is the most beat up one. But when you find a new color and you're like, Oh dude, the moon's going to be here and the rise is there and the boulders got this on it. And then you get the hit and you're like, I knew it. That's it. That. I will tell you, you know, being um, fishing playing with a fly rod and, and light tackle as well, that passion about the hooks or the, the uh the type of lip or the color of the bucktail or all goes through all of it yeah you know it is just i don't know i don't know it's wild i mean i think people think there's sand hill olive and silverside olive you know i mean <laughs> <laughs> we but we all think it like i still yeah. think, i don't believe in color yet i find myself believing in color i'm like i try to explain to someone and i think in my head i, I start i go oh color doesn't matter but white's definitely the best Unless yeah. it's a new moon and then you want black. But I mean, you don't really want black. You want purple because every bait fish has this color. But then sometimes the water is dirty and then you want chartreuse. But sometimes you don't want really the fish to see it. So you want more of a brown. And I'm like, they're looking at me and they go, you said color doesn't matter. Yeah. No, the goes. first three you hit, uh, right. you know, bone, blurple, you know, parrot or bright, you know, for dirty water. But then I totally agree. I can get on the brown program that, you know, the 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 Tatog and the the Choggies and all that are they look like that. And yeah. <laughs> so here we go. And, and then you're going in this, and I don't believe in color. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think here we're probably five minutes into this and, and everyone thinks we're both nuts. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> but that's but that's the best part. We're the same type of nuts. You're yeah, yeah. five hours away from me. And yeah. when we hang up the phone, you're probably gonna go in your car and do the exact same thing I am. Look yeah, at what yeah. you got and think about where you're going fishing tonight. 
Uh, and I think it's, that, a, it's think, a, it, uh, it, we're, we're lucky. We're, we're very lucky. And I think that a little bit older I get, I start to see my friends and they'll come fish with me sometimes, or they'll tell me how lucky I am to have such a passion for something. And mm-hmm. I'm not the only one. And you're not the only one. Mm-hmm. Anyone that's listening to this or anyone that picks up a fishing rod has that passion. And they're yeah. lucky that you can go do something and shut your mind off, which yeah. is really, really, really oh, cool. For, hey. for this guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mine's like there goes the pink squirrel you know and you, i mean it's at least uh but you know i tell you i told my wife this that honestly all that attention to detail or all that data taking in that you do with a mad case adhd like i have you know that's now relevant that that bird dipped its wing right because <laughs> maybe you know there's awesome. more, right you just take it all in you know all yeah. that data. so um you know you, you i didn't hear um how you started who who put the first fishing rod in your hand oh my dad did when i was like four years old and uh, and i I still remember everyone remembers their first some fishing experience and i think it was my first time fishing it might have been my 15th time yeah but i remember the first time i saw a a fish that was bigger than another one Mm -hmm. eat the worm that we had and i remember it getting reeled in i think my dad probably reeled it in it was a largemouth bass it was probably a pound but it was bigger than the little sunnies sure sure And I remember, I could still remember, I still could picture that part of the lake that we were in and like, wow, I remember every time I go by, I remember there was a big fish right there. And that was, that was kind of cool. And we follow, I just followed that up with, I liked fishing in high school, but I got more into sports. And then mm-hmm. I liked fishing when my, my family had a house in the Jersey shore and I would fish mm-hmm. all the time and I, and I let all bait, you know, but I liked it. I liked being so out from Metro New York in the first place. I'm from Metro New York. Yeah, I'm from upstate uh, outside the city, about 40 minutes, Westchester. And okay, then I sure. lived in Manhattan. I got I went to college there and then I got hired by the fire department super young. So I've been sure. living in New York City forever. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. The um, and I know you do uh, like all surf casters do some time at Montauk. Um, oh, yeah. That I mean, I, I used to make that. I used to live in Brooklyn. I know that drive is two and a half hours. Probably no. worse now. Probably yeah. worse now. Yeah. Getting off the water, oh, dark, whatever. How the hell do you? <laughs> I, yeah. Do I mean, there's been multiple, multiple times where you go out there and you get skunked, which makes you want to go back more. Or yeah. you get on the fish, which makes you want to go back more. I've, I've straight to the straight out of the water in the wetsuit, in the Jeep, to the firehouse, yeah. work the tour, get all I'm thinking about is the fish. Guys know they're like, what? what is up with you? What, like, uh, where's my relief? How am I getting out of here? What's going on? Uh, and then all the way back out only probably to get skunked again or, <laughs> you know, but yeah, yeah. Mon- well, Montauk is, is uh, the Mecca for a reason. And I, mm-hmm. I, one of my friends went there for the first time this year that I fish with, and it's not the Mecca just because of the fish. It's because of everything around it. It's Great. the atmosphere. When you get out, there. it feels fishy. That's yeah. exciting to a fisherman. When you go yeah. somewhere, you're like, Oh, this is great. And then you have all this area to explore. Every mm-hmm. spot has a spot and mm-hmm. that spot has a spot and every spot has a time and a place where it could be good or it's going to be good. And it doesn't matter if you fish the North side, the South side, the lighthouse, it's ever changing. And every rock out there at some point, some surf, cast, surf caster stood and caught right. a, a big fish. Every yeah, spot. You, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're part of a larger community in a place like that because it's documented you see pictures and you know that's the montauk light or whatever even if you're not i've been there a couple of times but you know you just sort of know that and you know you're walking uh the same beach as plenty of other oh giants your passion yeah Yeah, giants yeah legends you when you're doing that you are walking the same path that guys you read about guys that you met met you met with and the best part about there is you could go to paulie's tackle shop and those legends are there Paul right. himself's a legend or right. they, they, the guys you meet in the, in the parking lot or out while you're fishing. Right. Like, I think that's Don Musso. Oh yeah, it is <laughs> talking wow. to me right now about this. And you're like, I, for years I've been buying his lures and being right. so excited about the new super strike or the new color. Um, and Montauk just brings that excitement and it, it doesn't have to be about the fish. And my buddy who just went out there for the first time is like, you, you ruined me, man. I'm like, <laughs> He's like, because now I've got this three mile stretch that I have that I want to learn that I don't mm-hmm. want to leave. And I was like, I remember my first Montauk trip coming through the Hamptons and it was in September. It just started to cool off. 
and there's a windmill as you as you as yeah. you tell me. and I'm like, wow, it feels like I'm kind of going back in time. And then I got there and the, and the fishing, this was 10 years ago. Fishing was phenomenal. And it was hard not to catch one in September. Yeah. And I don't think I caught very many, but I caught a, a fish or two. And just everything about it was like almost magical. I remember calling my girlfriend at the time and saying, uh, babe, I, I don't think I'm coming home tonight. And she's like, what are you talking about? Aren't you in Montauk? I'm like, yeah. She's like, well, where are you going to sleep? I'm like, I'm, I'm going to get a hotel. She's like, with who? I'm like, by myself. She's like, why? I'm like, because I don't want, because I don't want to leave. And she's like, oh, 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 all right, I guess I'll see you tomorrow. I'm like, yeah. she's like, you're excited. I'm like, yeah, that checks out. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, right to the Albatross Motel, which that back then was probably eighty dollars a night. Oh, who knows now, you know, right? Yeah, in town. And I stayed and maybe caught or didn't catch the next day, but everything about it was magical. And I could just, you know, you could get that. I could smell it now. It's September. Yeah. It's hot as balls, but I, yeah. I can still smell it. I know it's flannel time. It's Jeep pack. That, that's just, we hope that's just around the corner. I tell you, I think for us, um, this warm weather of right now in late, uh, early September, mid September, really, um, is, uh, is keeping all the bait in the ponds. You know, I think yeah. it needs a little chill to get moving here too. I mean, there's yeah. bait, there's literally bait everywhere. And it's just a matter of, like I work, um, I'm working in a different firehouse right now, right on the East river. So yeah. I can go stick my head out pretty much any time. And I just, is it loaded with bait? I'm like, once this starts moving, it there's going to be, there should be a good amount of fish to be caught. If every I mean, fall, guys like you too. Every fall you take, you, you, you take a look at the water and you see all this bait and you're like, my God, I've never seen so much bait. And I bet if you just went back 365 days, same thing, seen the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is nature's just remarkable yeah. the way it pumps it out like that. Oh my oh, God. I mean, it might be different stuff, different years. Like I think we have more sea herring around right now than maybe usual. Cause that, you know, I was just talking with a guy at the shop today, one of my coworkers, you know, I'm on a pier and I'm looking down at the bait and you really can't tell you can get the length, but you can't get the depth, right? You don't okay. really know what it is. You don't have to know exactly what it is, but it's bigger yeah. than I was expecting. And it's just choking the harbor. Needs some cold weather to get it moving. And the fish will be waiting. No, yep. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, Jersey Shore. Were you a fisherman when you were down on the Jersey Shore? Oh, yeah, I loved it. I mean, that yeah. was what, I mean, that in, uh, that going to the arcades. But as a kid, like fishing was, that's what that's me and my brothers. That's all we wanted to do. To me, you got the, uh, the Jersey Shore with its sand, yeah. and Montauk with its uh, structure. Okay. What a what a contrast, you know. I mean, that there it is the surf casters, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, landscape. The whole the whole line end yeah. to end. Yeah. Well, then um, you add in the bays, and then you learn about the bridges. Mm -hmm. and... Bridges. Yeah. We don't, I don't ever do that, but I know that's a thing. Yeah, it's a thing. It's a it's yeah. a pretty consistent thing if you're good at it. Yeah, <laughs> which yeah. I'm not. But it's a that's a wild thing to do. Because um, I mean, do you have a type of structure you prefer, or do you have, um, you know, I think I think of you know like bass, you know, more in that, that bigger structure. One of the things that we's nice about Newport is we have uh, a lot of very deep, hard structure close to shore. Yeah, I mean, but those. Those boulder fields like you have at Montauk, or we don't have much of that. We are more like slate. Clips, you know, legend. And stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, Mike tried to kill me on one of those one day. Yes. But we won't talk about what place it was. Thanks. Yeah, no, no. Thanks but, for uh, your introduction and Craig's introduction and then Iron Mike and a, and a cooler that wasn't full of eels. And uh, <laughs> we, we made it back alive. <laughs> uh, but that kind of structure is, that kind of structure is, um, you know, uh, I mean, I, I find myself, I can watch the waves pound into to, into, into the cliffs we have here or or spill over a boulder field or or rip out uh, between a couple bars on sand. It's all, you know, there to be interpreted in red mm -hmm. and not acted upon. Um, do you have a preference? Do you like, um, you know, or it's very, I mean, you might, you know, I used yeah, to be a, this guy and now I'm a big that guy. Well, it varies time of year for me. Sure. It varies what type of fish I'm looking for what type mm -hmm. of fishing I want to do. I, I No one's going to believe it because most of my friends don't. My favorite type of fishing is October sand eels throwing tins and soft plastics on the sand. That's my that's my ultimate. Wouldn't have guessed it. Yeah. yeah. And it's, and it's, <laughs> most of the time, it's anywhere from 10 to 10 to 10 inch to 15 pound fish. Yeah. But I, I think it's, I love it. It's fun. And yeah. Especially we use these e-bikes now for a lot of different things, but you can get on your bike you can ride a stretch of beach. 
-hmm. You're fishing during the daytime. You could be fishing next to a guy who just started right. and, and he's just excited to be out there, which builds your excitement. Mm -hmm. And then if he hooks up, he's so excited, which makes you excited. And then you can catch a bunch of fish and get back in your car. And then you're like, all right, well, I could do it again tonight at sunset at, at a light change. And yeah. then go home and, and I could be somewhat of a normal person because the next day I just got to get up at four in the morning and go out. I don't have to stay up all night. Right. Um, you know, mixing I, it up that way is uh, I, I find, you know, as I've gotten old, a little harder to answer the bell sometimes, you know, and, and to find something fun like that, you know, um, is is a great. I mean, that's part of what I probably like about Albie fishing, you know, is the fact that they're uh, yeah. bankers hours. You know, it's kind of. Oh, and I think I think the overall atmosphere during that kind of thing where everybody's just there to have a good time or maybe right. to get one fish to eat is is I like it. Mm -hmm. My second favorite is a good nor'easter in Montauk where you get the same it's it's the same vibe from the surf casters. You get a lot like the lower lot in Montauk is where everybody kind of goes when, mm -hmm. when the storm's coming in and that's where you can sleep. You can get a 3-day pass, you get your state pass, you sleep there. <clears throat> but all of a sudden that lot will have three guys during the summer who are all know what they're doing and those guys know tides, winds, spots and they're chasing big fish. And they're yeah. catching way bigger fish than you're going to see in the, the fall when that lot's packed with people. But the right. vibe's different. Those uh -huh. guys don't want to they don't want to let you know when they're leaving their camper because now you know what tide they're fishing. They don't right. want to be seen. They're not going to tell you what they were catching. Yeah, well, yeah. And, and they're my friends and I'm doing the same to them. Right, but right. come the fall, that lot is bustling full of people of excitement and fishing. Oh, dude, I had some under the lighthouse. I had them at Jones's. Oh, no, you got to throw the yellow bucktail at false bar at, and everyone's excited and you go out and the waves are crashing and everyone's catching fish. And then you come back in and who's got what burgers and who's making yeah. what for tonight. And you all come together. And it's a, it's, it's just a, it's like a, it's like a fishing festival, a noise right. on talk. And it's great. It's a great, it's a very cool, very cool feeling. You know, there's, there's also the idea that, you know, you have to be like committed, like we've been talking about, but you also have to stay you know, you're gonna miss some certainly, but somewhat flexible because you can't dial up the northeast. You know, you know the northeaster. It comes when it comes, right? right. Yeah. And you got to make some changes. Maybe disappoint some people. Oh <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. I mean, there's that. My third type of favorite fishing is hunting. It's not yeah. fishing. It's hunting. It's finding patterns, <clears throat> trying to figure out where the big fish are, why. And uh, this year, and the last year, and this year, I learned that the 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 saying that everybody says, like, oh, once you think you know it, you don't. Like I was more than confident the last two years. I was getting cocky to the mm -hmm. point of, oh, I'm just going to go catch big fish. And then reality came in and said, uh, all right, buddy, everything you think, you know, is over. And it's back. So to is that fish. a population thing you think, or is that a bait thing? Or is that a, cause I mean, you know, one of the things that's kind of, I'm appreciating more than I did in the past is that the, the, well, the bait has a rhythm. You, all, you have a year that's really big this bait year, and then another right. year that's really big that bait. If that bait's more in um, river mouths and, and estuaries, then they're gonna it's gonna if, uh, impact the boulder field that used to, you know, pretty confidently fish. For example, you know what I mean? Because they're it moves the fish. I think it definitely that definitely happens. But like certain locations have a certain amount of resident fish that are gonna show resident up fish, in, yeah. in areas. And the, the, the bait thing's interesting because I used to say the same thing a couple of years ago. I'm like, oh, I'm not seeing any bait. There's no bait around. There's not going right. to be any fish. But is it that we're not seeing any bait or that those fish aren't around to show us the bait? Because when there's fish around, you know there's bait. There's yeah. no question. It's, it's, it's either busting or it's tight or it's in close. But there could be pods of bait passing by a surf caster. You'll never see. if it's Especially in the dark. Out. Yeah. Especially in the dark. Oh, right. well, definitely yeah. in the dark. But even when you're scouting, you're like, oh, I haven't seen any bait. I haven't. Oh. Well, the bait's not getting harassed, so it's doing whatever it wants to do. We see it when it's in our 40-yard window tight to mm -hmm. our rocks, sure, or 100 yards out where we could actually see it. Any further than that, we we're can't out. see it. And if the fish aren't telling us, hey, we're going to push it in, we're eating it, we don't see it. So I don't yeah. – I, I, yeah, I definitely think that the kind of bait makes a big difference and where the fish are going to be located for us to access. But there's always these resident fish around in each area that we all fish. They've been mm -hmm. there for 20, 30 years and right. they'll come in and they'll feed. And I've just had a harder time finding even a handful of them, which right. is, which for the first 
18 months was extremely difficult. Like a lot of complaining, a lot of worrying, what am I doing wrong? Oh, the fish population, whatever. And then it's turned now to, oh, I'm, I'm, I got to be a fisherman again. The yeah. alarm clock's now for three o'clock in the morning sometimes. It's not, I'm going out after dark. I'm not right. just wearing my usual handful of jigs and riggies. Now it's, all right, I need to be able to hit this water column. I need to be able to do this. Where are they going? Maybe I, maybe they're out a little further. Maybe they're in a little closer. And when, you're in a, when you're in a search mood, mode like that, um, yep. do you have a, a thought process that you use? Do you apply like water column or or profile or do you, do you have? Fish finder. I have a couple lures that are like, that I find are fish finders. They don't always eat them, but it's yeah. whatever I can They'll show. Them. Yeah, they'll show. They'll you'll get a ha you'll get a hit. You'll get a tap. You'll get something telling you, hey, there's a couple of fish here. And then you just then that's something I log down. Okay, we got some fish in this area. Let me go back and concentrate here. There's some fish over here. Let me concentrate here. Oh, I've caught a whole bunch of little ones here. Well, that means there's some bait. Those little ones are sitting there for a reason. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I I try and use things that like gliders. I I've seen that gliders get a lot of reaction strikes. Mm -hmm. needlefish cover a lot of area metal um, lips yeah metal lips but more more soft plastics oh when yes I found the fish then i'm thinking big metal lips riggies yeah. uh i know where they're at and now i want to get the big now i want them to commit they, right i want to get them yeah. but yeah. when i when i'm in a, a, a form of like just moving a, a frustration or trying yeah. to find them i'm using something like that sp minnows uh, they'll always eat a mag darter like it or not they're going to hit that thing coming by yep yep no it's uh it's i mean i've done 20 plus of these and and always you know excellent fishermen and there's some common denominators so it's very helpful to like think it through but also you know there is a um you know the idea of the of the resident fish and the and the the searching methodology the, you, it might be tweaks to the individual guy but they they definitely have a, a thought process that's probably you know that that they share on how to how to go after something you know because i think um you know i one of the talks i do in the to clubs in the winter you know i talk about these 10 two week seasons but also you can just it it the you know you eat, the expression is you eat an elephant one bite at a time it's a big ocean oh. and trying to chop it down into something where you see that uh that washout, um, that rip between the two bars, or you see the way the water flushes out of that boulder field or whatever about a bridge that I don't even know yet. But you start to, you know, uh, relate things that you've seen before to past success. And, you know, that's where I think you start to climb a, um, climb a mountain, if you will, in terms of being uh, prepared, you know? But so you said it's maybe at some point it got easy and then it got, it got hard again. Oh yeah. yeah. My, my partner, my fishing partner, Fred, says the same thing. It's very interesting. We do seminars about travel fishing. Yeah. And I ask all the time, what do you use? What, what should I use? What should I bring? And he says, bring what you're, bring what you're confident in. Right. If you catch fish on SP minnows at home, you better have an SP minnow in the bag. Because yeah. you know when that SP minnow is swimming the right way, when the fish at home hit it. Yeah. A fish in Florida is going to hit it. A fish in Mexico is going to hit it. A fish yeah. in Alaska is going to hit it. It's a predatory yeah. fish. Use what you're comfortable with. So when I'm in search mode, I go back, go totally back, just bare basics. Right. What do I know a fish is going to eat when I throw it in front of them? And and can I just, whatever conditions I have. Yeah. Can I make it, can I, can, can I make it look real? Can I make it look real on a consistent basis? And if yeah. I can, and I do that for a half hour in one spot and I don't get a bite. Okay. Log that. Yeah. Put a big X through it. That's not yeah. happening anymore. This spot you, is. You, you, after that half hour, do you change spots or change lures? No, I change lures after three to four casts. Oh. Oh yeah. Yeah, really? yeah. oh yeah. I well, I personally believe that if I'm putting myself in a position that looks right. what I want, the I'm, other parts are right. The tide, the moon, the right. And this and the 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 sweep of the current all that. is working. Mm -hmm. If I don't get a hit on top, and I don't get a hit in the middle, and I don't get a hit on the bottom. They're not, or or something that tells me there's a fish there. Right, the tap or whatever. I wait for my gut to say, eh. but usually, yeah, it's three to five casts in a spot with a per lure. One, yeah. two, three, four, five. Okay, did that swing here? Yeah, okay, I'll throw a little shorter. All right, maybe I got to bomb one a little further. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Okay, right. sit, let's go. Next spot. And I'll do that until I either find something or I give up on the night. And then I'll, once again, I'll talk to whoever I'm fishing with, the two of us, or by mm -hmm. myself. I'll go through my bag and I'll say, 
take this out. This didn't work. Take this out. This didn't work. Oh, well, this one felt good. We had the same conditions. Use this, this, and this. And then I start over again. Um, you know, I fished. I, I've told the story, you know, in the past. So someone may have heard it, but I think you're, you're, you're making the point again. Um, there's an offshore guy, uh, buddy of mine, Jack Sprangle, and we were fishing with a friend of his, uh, Lou DeFusco, offshore. And we we're at one of those uh, fads or floating, you know, debris. And um, he threw a lure in there and three mahi mahi busted out, right? And two cranks. And he's like, they don't want it. And pulled it out, swapped it for something else, threw it in there, half a crank, and he's tight. Yep. He's like, you know, because he can see it's a whole visual different than what you're doing. But I mean, you yep. could see it. But his point was, they're killers. They want that. They got the speed. They got the eyesight. They, they ate it. Yep. You know, and I think as I think about the rest of my audience, a lot of us would say, I need to slow it down or I need to this or I need these little subtle changes when it was like, you know, you've gone through your your hierarchy and your protocol and you're like next lure, five or six casts. He was like literally three cranks because he could see the whole thing. Yep. And then a half a crank later with a new lure and he was tight. I was like, it, it blew my mind at how certain he was that. That's good enough. My my presentation's good enough. Right. They're not here, which is what you're saying. Well, it's just it's the confidence of knowing that what you're doing with that lure is right. And that's and that's that's the whole point of only using a couple lures to start with. Is yeah. right, I know that what I'm doing with this lure is kind of I'm gonna get something from a fish. I, I'm not saying they're gonna eat it. Like there's that's why you carry different stuff. Like Jed, I read something that John Skinner wrote and it helped me tremendously. I actually caught one of my biggest fish ever because of it. Mm -hmm. And he said the same thing. This is a predatory fish. It doesn't miss. That fish did not want what you had. Yes, you interested it. Yes, yeah. it in feeding mode. It didn't, whatever mode it was in, it didn't want to eat what you had. Now change. You didn't close it. Right. Change, right. Be a closer. Change right. something and close it. And uh, I've used it before where I've thrown top water and you see the bass and he comes up. Maybe he smacks it with his tail. Maybe right. he twirls on it and, oh, he missed it. He missed it. And I still say, oh, he missed it. That thing didn't miss it. Now, if, he wanted <laughs> exactly to eat, right. if he wanted to eat that, he would eat it. It doesn't. Yeah. You click off the popper, put on a red fin, throw it back out. Now you bring it in and, and you're in. And you're yeah. like, that fish just wasn't sure. It saw it. It wanted, it's, ah, what is yeah. this? And then you're like, oh, okay, let me change quick. Um, and so I, when I'm in search mode, it's just to try and find something. Mm -hmm. And then once I do, then I'll, then I try and change my mindset into, all right, can I get them to eat more? Can I get a bigger one? Whatever, whatever it is. But if you got to start at the basics of finding them, sure. uh, that's why I think being mobile and having a couple different spots in a spot in your head mm -hmm. is important. Yeah. And also it sounds to me like if I, there's a theme I've heard from what you said and some others, it's to get, get, um, confident with a couple of lures so how would you take like i mean there's classics like the zigzag and the sp and the you know some of the ones we've already mentioned but um was that just over time or did you spend some time like on a pier swimming it by the you know do we were the things you it just came over time new, new lures i'll always i'll try and swim in front of me and think what what a fish might think personally yeah. uh, and then and then it's a lot of times if i get a new lure like I always carry it with me. If I got something I think is going to work or I heard works, it mm -hmm. goes right in the bag. And then I take that. And when I know there's fish in front of me, yes. and then yeah. I try and get them to eat it. And if they eat it, then I'm like, okay, they like it like this. That's going to help your confidence. <laughs> and there's your confidence. And yeah. then if, if they don't eat it, I start thinking, why are they not eating this? There's fish here. It, it's yeah. okay. Are they only eating off the bottom and this is up here? Or, no, no, no. It's, it's in the same spot. They don't want it. Yeah, it looks good to me. It looks great. Who cares? It comes out of the bag. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I give it to somebody else until I hear it's great. But yeah. I, that's how I get the confidence and stuff. Okay. Uh, right. Um, uh, what's that? What's the battery looking like on your computer? Uh, oh, we're still good. All right. Excellent. We haven't gone to Florida yet. I want to make sure we get on the road. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. So, um, you know, obviously a, a big passion for striped bass. One of the things I want to make sure the audience knows. Um, is that the when we first started the American Saltwater Guide Association, we had a meeting with a handful of people that, you know, from different parts of, quote, industry that uh, we thought would have something to add. And I reached out to you, uh, Steve Musso, uh, Craig Cantamo, um, and a handful of others. But I know that day that you got there, we're at the Soundview, which is now I drove by, uh, it's, in, you know, on the road in from Orient. It's quite fancy now. Okay. 
It was, it was still pretty, pretty divey. It wasn't divey when we were there, but it's up like a whole bunch of notches. We're not going. <laughs> the point is. <laughs> they, they wouldn't let us in now. Yeah, yeah probably. But the point is. Uh, you have a, 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 a uh, you know, I, I feel like a strong belief that, you know, uh, that we need to, to uh, if there's something that we love like this, we got to fight for it and we got to manage it in a way that'll give uh, that opportunity to, to uh, for us to continue and pursue our passion, but also for the next guy. I mean, we can't yeah. leave it worse than we found it, right? Oh, no. And I, it was great when you called everybody to go do that, because uh, we obviously, a lot of, a lot of the initial conservation for me came from a selfish point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, First off, I just, I don't believe in really killing anything unless, I mean, if you're going to eat harvest things different, I, I, I agree. I'm, I'm going to go get my bow tuned up and yeah. I, I don't like killing animals, but I definitely like harvesting venison. Um, yeah. I'll, I, I will harvest striped bass, but, se but selfishly I noticed the fishing was going down. There was mm -hmm. no question about it. When you, when you, when you were out there all the time, you, you saw it and then you talk to people and then you realize what sort of greed was behind a lot of this. You don't need two striped bass right like if you're gonna eat it why, why don't you just eat one and everything you guys were saying then maybe catch another one eat that too if that's what you want but they're gonna be fresher and all of it right and, but, but yeah. things that i saw piles of fish you know that one of the classic things is even when before i was really into conservation was being out at montauk and seeing the guys from the boats taking off all these huge fish and they would take pictures and they went in a dumpster mm. and it was like I, I don't understand. And <sighs> the dumpsters were full of fish, like big 30 to 50 pounders. And it wasn't one guy. It right. was every boat. It was guys were like, Hey, do you want a fish? No, no. And they'd ask and yeah. in the garbage they go, or people would come by my firehouse and, and offer us fish September and October. Hey, I was fishing. Do you want some fish? And you're like, no, no, not really. Oh no, take it. And you're like, well, I want what the fuck am I going to yeah. do with your, your fish? Like, and I started to realize like, why are we, why are we abusing a resource that doesn't have to be? This should right. be, everybody should be able to enjoy it. And you then I think about it first. What are you going to do with this? If you want to keep it, what are you going to do with it? If you're going to keep it and then try to give it away, that's just silly. That's a it, fish is too valuable to be caught once Correct. And, and, and get freezer burn or offered. Now to you're you're taking that by, by killing that one fish, you are yeah. now taking it out of the biomass pot that could possibly be adding to the population for 20 years. Yeah, yeah. Are, are you doing that for a good reason? Are we all we all hanging out? We're gonna have ceviche and enjoy yeah. the barbecue. And even by harvesting a fish like that, maybe there's a new person involved who sees the joy that we're getting from fishing. Yeah. And then you teach them the conservation ways that that it's okay, it's all right. You can harvest the fish, but yeah. you don't want to waste it. Right. And now That's by actually really harvesting cool. that fish, we've now saved more fish. Yeah, because you, you you teach new people like, hey, you don't have to kill everything you I catch. Think, you know, things are changing slowly, but they're changing. And, 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 you know, I'm really happy with the work the guide association done. And I particularly getting a couple of thought leaders like you and, 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 and Steve and Craig and guys like that in there early. Cause in fact, me, I don't know so much talked about it, as we realized we kind of shared this, you know, this, this longer term view. So well, what guys don't understand is what that, I mean, I appreciate you having me on the show and I'm, I don't want to just like, uh, like brag about you, but what you guys did that people don't see behind the scenes, like yeah. it's easy for what we did. Cause we just did what we always did. We took pictures with fish and we let them go. Cause that's what we like to do for whatever right. reason. That's what you guys actually had to fight people who didn't like you. Like, right. legit, like we, we had a little bit of backlash, but we're all whatever, you know, I work at a firehouse. You can say whatever you want about me. It's been said for the last 20 years and maybe yeah. it'll be said for the next 20, 10 years, whatever. Yeah. You're not going to hurt my feelings. You you guys actually had to go up against political opponents. You had to go up against people that were so ignorant that what came out of their mouth. I'm not saying if it was one group, it could have been a group of surf casters, but the, right. but they were defending ideas that were irrational. And yeah. you guys were just trying to say, hey, let's make this work for everybody, right. not not just your own selfish reasons for right. everyone. And you, yeah. and you no, really you know, the chin. If, if you uh, if you end up if you can create an abundant resource, everybody benefits. Everybody wins. That's that's yeah. what it boils down to. So uh, thank you for that, though. And uh, and thank you for showing up the sound to you that day. I know you had well, to drive from a firehouse, whatever that two and a half hours, and you weren't going to fish. So God bless you, too. <laughs> um, so tell me about tarpon. Now, something happened because you're all the way in. I know you bought a place down there. So you got to tell me what uh, what got you going on tarpon. Do you not like to shovel sun? You can't shovel sunlight. I know that. So it's like, as soon as uh, you're retired, are you the hell out? Or 
No, I, I love striped bass. I love the I love the Northeast. Um, okay. I'm definitely going to move down to Florida. Probably spend more of my time down there, uh, mm -hmm. just because, like you said, when you leave the Northeast in January and February, and you get to Florida, as soon as that door opens, the humidity. Yeah, the humidity, the sun, <laughs> the attitude changes. Up here, you open the door. Sometimes you go to work at six in the morning. It feels like somebody punched you in the face. Yeah, like yeah. that's not how I want to start the day. Like. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but it, some people like the cold. Me personally, as an outdoorsman, I don't. Yeah. So that's the initial attraction to down yeah. there. And now you add that you have an unlimited area to fish of beaches and rivers and inlets, and you have multi species. And bridges. And, and bridges. Oh, and yes, and bridges. Oh, yeah, the bridges are really good down there. But there's, you have all these multiple species, and you have bait runs, and you have everything that we have here except you put a zero on the end of every fish. We catch 10 pounders, they catch 100 pounders. We yeah. catch 20 pounders, they catch 200 pounders. Yeah. And no, I don't always want to have a 200 pound fish pulling me around. But when your drag is pulling so hard that your reel is hot and you're looking yeah. down, you're like, oh, I'm going to get spooled. And now you think back to like every bass you caught that took 15 yards and you thought you were going to get spooled and you're 450 in on a 275 and you're like, I still got 100 yards left, I'm good is yep. a is an exhilarating experience and to be it's able to from the beach of, right or from from yeah the beach. the beach for the most yeah, part sometimes somewhere. Straight, from, straight from the beach yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's it's great and those fish same thing and they, they do a nice job down there protecting their their uh their species they recognize it's the economy yeah oh yeah yeah fish a bunch of it i mean i think that's where all this dirty water got its real you know once that was happening and people recognized some of the consequence um to the economy they yeah. started making some changes, but I know, you know, they've always, uh, Florida has been a leader really in creating uh, fishing tourism. Yeah. Cause it's money. I mean, yeah. and it's the cool restaurants thing and hotels and the rest of it. Everything. Oh, buy a house. I, I bought a house. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's real estate. But everyone down there, like you'll notice like up here, somebody might look a little strange at you when your rods hanging out the front of your car, you know, yeah. down there, everybody's got a rod out the back of the pickup, out the window. Fishing yeah. is, it's a, it's a way of life in, in, all the communities down there. It doesn't matter what community is. Some I understand. I, I might not be true, uh, exactly true, but I understand um, a very big real company, um, not the first one you and I would think of, but the second one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> they um, basically have a, uh, Florida and then not everybody else, but there might be seven or eight territories and one is the state of Florida. And the rest of it, the other 49 states get chopped up into seven or so. I it's when it's I that big. You know, it's, it's that big. It's huge. It's, it, it, but everybody, there's a, there's, here you would never put it. I mean, you're a surf cast. As surf casters, we don't put stickers on our cars. It is 90% of the time, just because you don't want somebody following you. We're all sick in the head and with all that, right. I, me included. But down there, there's a snook sticker on a car. There's a redfish sticker on a car. There's a toy, and that's normal. It's next to, it's just how it is down there. And that's a very cool experience as a fisherman is to see other, be surrounded by other fishermen yeah. at some point. And, and it's almost every day. They'll talk, you talk to somebody on the beach. Oh yeah, we've been catching Pompano or, Hey, did you see the mullet running? Or that's just your regular everyday guy. Some of the, some of the videos of the mullet run and all that and the tarpon stuff are just nuts. Yeah, it's nuts. Super. And so that, and that's, um, um, that's some lure fishing, some soft plastics. I know you like no live bait needed in that situation, but it was you guys kind of broke the code, or maybe not joined the joined the folks that are already doing it, perhaps. But fishing lures too, right? Like we would from home, literally, right? That's, like a, like that four inch squid from North Bar, or things like that. It's killing distance. down there for yeah. distance, right? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. and it's it's just the lures that you use here are the are the exact same lures we use down there and it wasn't it wasn't trial and error from my little group where uh, we went down and fished with alberto probably eight or nine years ago yeah. and he kind of introduced us to like florida he did introduce us to florida fishing and the more i talked with craig afterwards when we met small groups that were doing that were fishing with just lures 90 percent of the time when we would ask people like oh hey how's the how's the fishing oh good what do you use They're like oh you need shrimp or you use cut bait or this right. and, it's always yeah and Alberto told us, you're going to meet a lot of people that say that. And Craig, too. So the same thing. You're going to meet a lot of people that say, oh, you need bait. But you don't. Just right. fish how you do here, down there. Just upgrade all your stuff. Like right. your hooks, your split rings, your leader stuff. And uh, 
and you'll do just as well. And we did that. And now you see, not because of us, but the culture of fishing down there has changed a lot with a lot of the younger kids fishing. And they mm. don't want to fish bait. They want a van stall. They mm. want to be on the beach. They want to use soft plastics, no live bait needed, whatever they, they want to be out there because they think it's cool. They want to wear cool stuff because it is cool. Fishing down there is cool. Right, and right. They have their groups. They go fishing. You see girls fishing. You see, but the but the age group is a lot down there. Is a lot younger. We have a lot. That's interesting. I didn't really know recognize the younger part. Oh yeah, they, the big yeah. market. I didn't realize that it you know was younger too. And you know, you mentioned Alberto. He's lived there for now a long time. Yeah, you know, probably a decade, I guess. And you know, on the west coast, but he makes regular runs, uh, you know, missions, if you will to uh, fish all over Florida. I mean, it's that kind of a, uh, of a resource, pretty incredible. Um, so tell me, uh, you know, about uh, maybe uh, the, your, your primary focus is tarpon or do you catch snook and other things or? It, the, the only, the difference down in Florida that's really hard is because of multiple species, they act, yeah. a, little, they act a little different. They're all predators, mm -hmm. but if you're gonna go try and catch snook on tarpon gear, you're gonna have a lot harder time because, yeah. because of yeah, snook. Focus. Right? like tackle selection and all that for tackle selection. So if you, and it's happened to me multiple times where I go down scouting and I'm like, all right, I don't want to bring my heavy stuff. I'll bring my snook stuff, which is a seven to nine foot rod, 150, a hundred, even, even a 50 sometimes up to a 150, 30 pound braid, 20 pound. And smaller and lures. Uh, they'll eat depending on what's around bigger stuff, but yeah, smaller lures work sometimes. Just they're smart. The, the, yeah. the, 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 I'll go into the difference of the snook, but you go Good out time. and you book tarpon <laughs> and you're yeah. like, Oh no, like this is the last thing I want to hook right now is this 130 pound monster. Right. And he's <laughs> like, oh. and you see why we used to talk to the Floridians. They'd be like, like, oh, you come up like, oh, you see any tarpon? They're like, yeah, they're everywhere. And they like stomp off and you're like, yes. And then <laughs> like, why don't they like, you see that a trend of guys being like, oh God, tarpon. You're like, why? Like, well, what are you going to do with it? You can't eat it. He's going to ruin yeah. all your stuff. But to us, like, oh, I have a chance of catching a triple digit fish. Really? That's right. right. From the beach? Just, yeah. From the beach. Yeah. Wow. So it's uh, that's different. And then the, the way the guys think down there when they fish, they're phenomenal fishermen, mm -hmm. but a lot of those guys are species oriented. Snook fishermen are snook fishermen, tarpon fishermen are tarpon fishermen. Gotcha. Redfish. Kind we're, of we're kind of surf casters. And if it's a blue fish or a striper or a schoolie, like you're saying all the different, yeah. this is, we chose the, the place we fish, uh, they chose the, the species, species. they're chasing. Got Correct. It. Like, think about going out and fishing for weak fish and you're using real light stuff and you run into a school of 40 to 50 pounders. Yes, yeah. you can still land them, but you're going to have a much harder time. Right. It's the same thing, except they're not 40 and 50 pounders. They're 200 pounders. And now all your stuff's ruined. Like your night's ruined. Like I, that thing just fooled me. How many real, I mean, how many light spools of line do I carry with me? I have my rod and my, so in their head, they, they, they're different and they're, those fish act a little different. Like their snook migrate, but they migrate from the river to the inlet, to the beach. And they stay in this one stretch of area. That's where they live. Mm -hmm. So those fish have seen lures. Those fish have been hooked before. There's all sorts of different things. Our striped bass could be in Montauk one day, Maine three weeks later, and yeah. then come all the way down to Monmouth, New Jersey, you know, they, right. they, they just run all over the place. These fish have been behind the same rock for six years yeah, during wow. that time of the year. And they've seen sure. bucktails and soft plastic. Yeah, yeah. They've seen it all. So they could be sitting there. So you talk to a good snook fisherman and they do match a lot of color with the location or the size with the location. And, yeah. and they know that if they threw a lure in front of that snook once and he didn't strike it, he's not going to hit anything else. He knows yeah. something's up. That fish knows. Like last time this happened, I got yanked out of here. I got a hole in my face. The guy yeah. strangled me. I got blinded by some lights and then I got <laughs> let go. So they'll, it's very interesting. I've talked to a guy who he matches his plastics with the color of the water and he likes it dirty. He said, mm. because if I, if he throw a chartreuse, the fish gets a really good look at it. It's like, mm. oh, okay. Something's coming. Oh, all right. Oh, look at that thing. No, oh, it's not food. All right. I'm going to leave it alone. But if he throws something that matches the color of the water, the fish feels it, knows it's there. And, and then it still looks it. like something. Right. But it's not sure what it, it, it can't yeah. really tell. And now he's got to make a decision. Like another fish comes up, you know, competitive. Is yeah. it, is he about to take it out of the water, come up and get it before it gets away? 
reaction strike. It was just another way in my head. I'm like, I wonder how many times a bass has gotten too good a look at my stuff and been yeah. like, oh, I really see that. Oh, I don't want to eat it. You know, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I had, uh, I was on vacation, but I remember seeing the snook and thinking, oh, okay. Yeah, easy. And I got just worked. I did, I struggled. I did yeah. not hook up. Yeah. You know, and, you know, I know I could be more accurate. I have a buddy of mine that, um, uh, who's a who's a guide and, and we were together uh, down on the west coast of florida once and um you know he jumped up to to fish that day and you know he fishes for snook and he had a you know, seven foot st croix thing like everybody has and he threw a laser like you know 70 feet into a mailbox i mean just like space wise yeah we don't do that. Beach no. get, you know, bed spread. <laughs> We're like, that's what we do. Right. And that's how exact you gotta be. Yep. And it they was, blew my mind. They're phenom they're phenomenal fishermen. I there's no quite there's no there's no time I I'll go down there and outfish a Floridian. They right. will outfish me 10 out of 10 times. <laughs> but I they're a lot of times they're very forth going with the information. So I get to learn yeah. each time, especially the kids. The kids that, that throw flare hawks and plastics are phenomenal. And you'll look at them and you'll be like, the kid's in shorts and he's got two things in his pockets and now he doesn't want pliers and he's breaking the line with his teeth. But he's <laughs> going to go down and he's going to whack five or six fish yeah. and then he's going to leave. And then you're never going to see the kid again because you weren't that, that you were lucky. You were there at the right time that he knew like, all right, this is when they're going to start feeding. This is when they always do. And if I throw this, I get them. If not, I leave. And that's gotta be something that probably happens. Like you said, with the routine of the estuary to the river, to the trough, to the yep. rock, you know, living in some place. Yeah. I mean, I fish like us for up here. That's like, that's probably more like a to talk in the sense that they go to a, a specific you know, rock pile, they live in an area, you know, and then okay. they go offshore and then they come back to that. And they same come back. Area. Yeah. Right. And, and um, how do you catch most of them? They, they eat live bait. Now, yeah. if you're live baiting in Florida, it's a totally different story. You can go yeah. anywhere with a live mullet, throw it in there. And if you know um, tides, winds, patterns, yeah. that snook's going to eat it. Yeah. There's no question. There's a live mullet. mullet. He's going to eat it. <laughs> yeah. right? He's like, all right, that's, that's the food I eat. So, he, so they eat it, uh, which gets a little bit on the frustrating side. But you can trick them. It's just another piece of the puzzle and learning how to do it because the guys do do it. You see them They're like, oh, man. And so I, I know you're pretty busy down there, but don't do you offer a guide business or a lodge operation or something when you when you're there? Uh, yeah, uh, me and my partner, Fred, we bought a place called the Rain Tree House, which yeah. is centered in Fort Pierce, Florida, a little bit up north of West Palm. And it's just a it's a beautiful like paradise house with a pool and a guide shack. And we run a one month guide service which we're going to extend now because we're overbooked every okay. year it's just tough because we got jobs but yeah, yeah. it's an all-inclusive guide service you come down and pick you up at the airport you got all the van stall top high-end rods you want all yeah, the yeah. gear and you get to stay you have your own room in this paradise house and uh nice. you go fish it twice a day and everybody as long as we don't get completely blown out by weather yeah everyone has a shot at a fish of a lifetime yeah the difference is down there is you hook a tarp in its mouth is like a concrete yeah Fuck. so right. it spits it it breaks it breaks your line it rolls on it gets eaten by a shark it, it, there's so many factors to landing that fish but you have a shot and yeah. uh, everyone i've talked to over the last couple of years that have come down is just that it, even even the biggest critics when they're first there like oh i don't know about this by the end it's like i gotta come back I can't. <laughs> i'm like oh yeah. you didn't catch anything well that no no Dude, you remember that time I had that one? And like what you saw or what could be. You're absolutely right. And I mean, some of those videos I've saw of, of, of surf guys and fly guys jumping tarpon from the beach. I mean, you can under it's pretty pretty. I mean, just to get that fish into the last wave, I think would be an awful lot to oh. manage. Big fish, you know, the crashing wave. Oh, you know, predators could go wrong right there before you put your hands on it. Yeah. Crazy. No, it's I, I went over. I mean, 40 might be a little low, but I went somewhere between 0 for 40 and 0 for 50, 60 last trip on tarpon. I So I went down and it was the perfect storm. We had a full moon. We had a hurricane. We had the bait getting ready to move. It was the perfect storm. And mm -hmm. there were a couple of fish before the storm crashed. And then after it crashed, it was on. It was on for a week. I didn't land one. Not one. So you, you were talking about hooking 40 or so and not landing any? At least. 
Oh yeah. You're looking at, at hook, depending on how good the morning was or evening. Uh, and a lot of times they even fished into the night, even though they were there, it was, yeah. I, I probably hooked 40 or 50 and I, I stuck three. I had three stuck. Uh, yeah. One broke me off uh, and two straightened hooks. And every one, uh, every other one was hookups, jump offs, hookups, runs, jump offs. Yeah. And that's just, that's tarpon fishing. And then I saw my buddy went out one day and he got 150 pounder his first day, probably the first one he hooked. So there's no, uh, <laughs> you the innovation, if you look around here, uh, the innovations I've been trying to come up with, how to stick one of these things on a I consistent am. basis. I've come up with every sort of idea. It's, you and, know, one of the things I know the fly guys have done is the hooks have gotten smaller. So they yeah, pierce better. Yeah. But that's not an option on a, on a surf ride. I, I've so, thought about that. They use yeah. small, and you could also fly guys a lot of times can chase them. Yeah. You know, they can with the boats. The, yeah. the shore guys get them too. The shore guys hook way. Oh, you're right. You're stuck on the beach. So you don't you have that. enough to. I mean, these things were straightening out legit hooks. So uh, I can only imagine what they're going to do with a little one. Yeah. Because that is that it, the, the hook diameter or the point you get, get to create helps with that penetration. Of course. Yeah, and now we're sure. using these huge, right. these big hooks. I, I've tried, I've tried and talked to a lot of people. Um, I got spoiled. My first tarpon I hooked 10 years ago, I landed. And it was triple digit fish. First one. And then didn't <laughs> land another one for, I don't know, a year and a half. And then some <laughs> nights you land, you hook three and you land three. And yeah. some nights, some trips you go, it was so, it's so addicting and so exhilarating that I had, didn't have to work for, I say I was coming, I was supposed to come home on a Friday and I'd have to work till Sunday. I said, I, I, I can't go home. Like I had like the, I guess what a drug addict shakes were. Yeah. I'm yeah. like I'm sitting on my couch watching my flight coming in, and I'm like I can't I can't leave what yeah. I what I had seen the night before. It was a surf caster's dream, and I had two Florida guys with me who aren't surf surf casters. They're they're, yeah. they're fishermen and they fish the surf, but they don't the crashing waves getting yeah. soaked. And we had six to eight foot swells coming in. Wow. We got out there a little late the first evening, but they were coming in, and mullet was getting blown over a rock pile, and mm. it was tarpon blitzing like bluefish on mullet as the sun setting six wow. foot waves top water bring them in boom they hook you're hooking up now you're trying to keep your feet under you because you're getting smoked with a wave and you're in your yeah. board shorts and you're holding your buddy as he's getting pulled in <laughs> it, was, it was everything that you dream of as yeah. a surf fisherman except the fish are 100 pounds bigger than what we usually catch and yeah. we didn't land one but the we the smile we were laughing and to witness the whole thing must have been unreal it's unreal. It's unreal. It's it, and a lot of times they're ten feet out, twenty feet out in the surf. Yeah. Well, let me let me transition to to a project I know you've been working on, where I think uh, honestly you just kind of described what you were trying to capture uh, with uh, with the your movie project Magic Hour. I know uh, it's going to premiere here uh, in early October in Newport, and but also on Long Island. Where on Long Island? Oh, uh, it's going to be in the Rockaways. The Rockways, okay. Yep. And there'll be plenty of details to get on that. Yep. But the point is Magic Hour was a couple year effort, right? To sort of capture a lot of what you just described. Yeah, it was a it was a two year project where uh we weren't it was more of a project of, of like passion. We yeah. weren't sure what it was gonna be when we started it. Uh we just knew that my buddy's a filmmaker and he's an outdoorsman. And uh over the last he's also one of my best friends from Paintball, and over the last 10 years, he's really been interested in the whole fishing thing. And we started, he's like, why don't I just bring my camera along? He's like, mm -hmm. your videos are so rudimentary and, and gorilla. I'm like, I know I got a GoPro. I don't know what I'm doing. My editing's awful. He's like, let me bring my camera and let's see. He's like, if you'll carry my rod and if guys watch Project Magic, I would be like, why does he have two rods? Because that's the deal. I, I would carry his rod yeah. and he would bring his camera stuff. And we started capturing things and we started to see that we wanted to be able to show not just the passion that one person has is that mm -hmm. each of us is the same. doesn't matter if we're from Florida or Montana or New York. It's the, it's the same look on everyone's face that yeah. they get when they're chasing these fish or, and it's, we wanted to be able to show that. And then, so we traveled around and we went to these exotic places that we were going to go anyways and just documented. And it so all some of it came from Northeast. Some of it came from Florida. Did you, was Baja in there or, or, or any, anywhere else? Or, or Alaska's. Yeah, we did. We did. Uh, there's, we started in Florida then we worked up to a couple spots in the Northeast and then we went to Alaska and then we came back uh, to Florida and there was a lot of, there was, there was some success. There was a lot of failure. There's uh, a lot of behind the scenes stuff that of course goes, goes with uh, 
a year and a half, two years of making a movie. Yeah. Uh, but it was really fun. And I, and I hope everyone like enjoys it. And we're going to, there's going to be a couple more of these. And mm -hmm. like, we were lucky. I got to highlight uh, one of the kids. that's a really good fisherman in Montauk. And it just shows like his level compared to what he's willing to do compared mm -hmm. to what everybody else is willing to do is way mm -hmm. more than anyone can imagine. Like, yeah. Even, even myself, like I, I, I was like, wow, this is just next level from what I thought was next level. Mm -hmm. Uh, and to see he's, somebody he's younger, that, he's younger, right? He's 20 years younger. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's I think that comes in almost, I would argue in most, uh, lots in life. If you're sharing, if you share a passion with someone who's that much younger than you, they've, they've, they've peeled another layer of the onion or looked at it different just yep. cause, you know, cause they, of their, their journeys just was, is 20 years removed from yours. You got where you got. Yeah. Now one's better or worse. You're both, uh pursuing your passion and 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 they end up maybe uh i know i see it in, you know um in some other things too you know that they just did it they uh you, you're like damn i didn't think of that or well that's and that's our whole idea for this is to be impressive. able to highlight these different anglers yeah. all over the country all over the world and show their passion and yeah. that's what i'm hoping that kind of came from the movies is, is, is there's some magic to it like yeah. we can't ex we can't explain why we love it so much or you there's no way like you try and tell someone's like hey why do you love fishing so much it's like i i can't really put it totally in words you have to be there you know uh at the very beginning we got to the part where you're talking about it all comes together yeah you know? and that's how you chose i think the magic hour right? right and it seems to me like you're trying to capture it coming together in these different places for different people and the personalities that are in there and everything else I, i'm looking forward to it Correct. Um, look, and thank you so much for uh for uh, including Newport on the tour. It's going to be a blast. Oh, I appreciate it, dude. I, I can't wait. Um, yeah. Well, it's only a couple of weeks away. I know. Um, so let's switch gears uh, before your battery quits. Um, so I got a couple of wrap up questions. Okay. Um, what are two lures? Uh, maybe they'd be part of your searching protocol or something that you might suggest uh, for someone who's, you know, recognizes that when they can't find fish, they got to like get change their mindset and, 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 you know, maybe it's two lures that they're confident in or, Here's two examples of yours. What do you, do you have any suggestion there? Yeah. I've, over the last couple of years, I've come to be absolutely in love with soft plastics. I yeah. would take, if I had, could only pick like two lures, one would be depending on the area that I'd be set fish, but it'd be an ounce, ounce and a half lead head with some sort of five inch paddle tail. Okay. That, that sounds like no live bait needed to me. Yeah, I think they're the best. I mean, I don't want to go against anyone. Or, oh, yeah, Jeff. But I mean, that's that's when I pro typically that's what I'm thinking of right now. Not yeah, a, not a swim shatter where it's all internal. It's right. you can swap. Yeah. Yeah, I want to be able to. I want it to be. If I only have two, I want it to be universal, and I want to know that fish are going to eat it. Yeah. The no live bait needed or or something like that. That mm -hmm. streamlined where it fits the plastic perfect. You can cast it far. That's you can right. work it in the bottom. You can work it in the middle. I mean, and you're changing that, that with speed, right? Changing that with speed. Yeah. You yeah. retrieve and, speed. You can. And your point about uh, casting it a long way is it's such a good match between the tail and the head that right. you don't have that wind resistance when you, when you're not doing it right. Uh, you feel Helicopters. It. like, yeah. Big. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. Helicopters too. Right. Uh, is there another one like yeah. a, a swimmer or something? I mean, mag darter. Yeah. For a swimmer. Well, I <laughs> I hate the mag darter. I, I, it catches it's so good. many fish. I, I, the SP minnow would be if I was going to use a swimmer because okay. yeah. everything eats it uh, yeah. and it casts pretty far. And I yeah. just have a ton of confidence when they first came go. out. Did we That's what you described. You need two, two lures that you're confident in to do your searching. And yep. what you just described is something that reel it slow with a, with a, with the uh, lead head. You're going to be uh, jig head. You're going to be deeper, a little yep. faster in the middle. Probably the swimmers above that. Is that kind of okay? And that's enough. That'll yeah. that'll cover enough of a water column. Fish uh -huh. are blowing up on top. And you throw an SP minnow in there. There we go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> excellent. That's big help. Um, what are two resources you use as you start to get ready on a on a trip as you're planning to go? You you know, is it uh, what are, what are some of the resources you might use? Uh, well, Navionics. Yeah. On my, my phone's my biggest resource is yeah. uh, is Navionics because it'll tell me ma the main thing I like about Navionics is you can do an overlay where you can see what the structure looks like right. and it can get you away from other anglers. So yeah. if you can find what the structure looks like that guys are catching in, in a popular spot, duplicate that 
just down the road. Yeah, yeah, somewhere else. No, the fisher go like this down the whole coast. Yeah, you yeah, right. You're gonna find. You're gonna find, and yeah. it tells you. It also tells you uh, tides, and it'll tell you more importantly currents, yeah. where you can find the closest inlet and find when the current's moving, because it that doesn't directly correlate with the tide ninety nine percent of the time. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's something that that you have to learn is that is it you got to find out when the current's moving a certain direction in most spots. Some spots it's what the tide level is, but mo I find most is there's a sweet spot that those fish like in the current. If, if, there, was a, if there was a, if there was if there's a common thing uh, again I've heard through a lot of these podcasts with different expert anglers is they always talk about current, they rarely talk about tide. Right. You know what I mean? The, the, yeah, exactly. Um uh two tips to improve. One I would I'm going to I'm going to uh give you your own first right off the top. It's curiosity. You got mad curiosity, right? That's why you try different things and that's certainly one way to improve is to keep an open mind. Yeah. And the second one, nobody likes to hear, myself included, mm -hmm. is fish your local spots. Clo fish the spots the easiest for you to get to and diff on different conditions. Yeah. So say you have a northeast wind, you can get there quickly and try it. You have a southeast wind, you can go to another spot that's close and try it. Have spots close to where you live or the easiest spot for you to get to to fish yeah. that and learn it really well on every condition because once you learn that you mentioned it earlier is is those that'll all transform in different spots that you go to yeah. but if you're chasing that or not chasing if you're constantly going other places looking for better fishing you'll never learn exactly what it looks like when it should that's, so, that's great advice so you must have done that before you started you know making bigger move like driving all the way out to montauk just to is a is a big commit from your right. Manhattan, right? Yeah, Manhattan. Yeah. But if if I'm not saying don't, I'm saying if get to the get to learn your spot, pick You're a spot close learn, to home where you can get a lot of time in. Where you can get a lot of time in, right? right. All right. Excellent. Um, I'm glad we've made it this far, and and your uh your laptop yeah, right. is quit. Um, and we've gone a little over to to our regular time, but uh, I, it, it, that's what happens when you and I get going. Yeah, yeah, you know, it always seems like longer conversations, whether we're talking about marketing or surf casting or whatever. So I'm always uh, always enjoy my time with you. I got one question uh, left for you. Um, you have one um, one day left to fish. Where are you fishing and what for? Not your not where, but I mean, what for? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I have one day left to fish. All right. Uh, it's definitely going to be striped bass. Mm -hmm. uh and if i could only yeah if i could only fish one more time i would fish i would fish a nor'easter in montauk for striped bass during the daytime yeah visual enjoyment yeah. and when you hook a bass you can land them the damn tarp and you're gonna hook a hundred and they're gonna just shake yeah, yeah. <laughs> your story isn't gonna end well that last day is gonna be frustrating screw yes. that yeah. big smile but frustrated I, as soon as i got back from florida the first bass i hooked i'm like i know you're coming in yeah and yeah yeah. came in i'm like oh i got one so um this is a chance for you to share you know your website social media any cause or resource you might want people to check out and uh we'll be sure and put any information you share with us now in the uh, show notes but where can people uh find out more about you where would you direct uh, them? yeah if you go to the, we have a uh, comanche surf casting Mm -hmm. uh and that's an instagram and uh okay. and a facebook page yep. if, you, if you write us on there it's real easy but we try and respond to everybody questions anything uh mine is the smiling tan man which somebody gave me gave me as a name and it just <laughs> it just stuck so that they set uh, up your did they set up your social media for you yeah well, that wasn't mine mine was oh, my real name they did a, <laughs> i know you joked yeah. about the trouble you were having getting the zoom to work and now i just realized that that probably is true yeah that you wasn't mine it. you didn't <laughs> pick it yeah oh, so, man. uh and so, then uh comanche surf casting and instagram is the best place to learn more yeah, right. that's a good place. Yep. Is the Magic Hour info there too? Or is that another Magic place? Hour will be up on there when we do. And uh also phasegear.com. Yep. Tell me about uh, that real quick. Uh it's just it's a it's a project that we started to make surf casting gear for gear for fishermen that fish the way that we like that we like to fish. Yeah, I love it, dude. Yeah, yeah, I tell you, I got thousands of you know sun hoodies, but this is one of the ones that has a nice hand feel to it. I like it. It's nice, right? definitely nice yeah, job. We're, 
that's what the, we call them pro these are called pro tops and they're everything we do is kind of multifaceted it's like for a surf caster you don't have just one lure you need to make that lure do five different things mm -hmm. we don't have a lot of room to carry stuff so right. we thought the same like this could be worn as casual this also gets worn over your wetsuit could yeah. be worn under your waders because it, it you know it's made of a quick dry material anyways the the, the phase gear stuff is made for for fishermen to be yeah. functional but also kind of you could go out and say, Hey, I am a fisherman. Like, yep, yep. It, yeah, is there a fish on there? Yeah, there's a fish on there. Oh, you fish? No way. What is that? Well, I tell you, I get I get to a cocktail party or something. I'm looking for some clue. Right. Of where to start. <laughs> and th and this is and this is our life. It's the phase. Yeah. It, it whether it's a bait moon, a bait phase, or a moon phase, right. or even your angling phase as it is. We all we all go through them and yeah. We're, and we're all part of one community, so that's why we that's why we came up with the phase thing. And we got a we got a whole bunch of stuff that we're still working on, and got Excellent. some stuff out there yeah, on all that spare time you have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, man. Go oh, my always, always a good time. Always a good time. And thanks for uh, sticking with it on the technology and everything. I'll see oh, you thanks. October third in oh. uh, Newport, Rhode Island. I can't wait. I might be out there too the night before trying to catch some of your fish. Sounds good, man. You take all care, right, Peter. Take care, Later. brother. Bye bye. Later.